Hello, um, hi, and welcome back on the French is Speak English with the Little English Box. I've just had quite technical problems, quite a lot of technical problems. So hopefully you can hear me now and you can see this live. I just don't know because I've been trying three times and three times my screen was completely frozen and I couldn't move. So. I don't know if you can hear me now and let's have a try. So if you are connected to this live, please put it in comments just below if you can hear me, if you can see me and what is your name? And so welcome back here. And in today's video, as you probably have seen in the planning, it's how to understand your level, how to talk about your level, how to present it when you go to a job interview, how to define it and how important it is to know your level in English. So uh, some of you have, oh yes, cool. Hi Fanny, it's good to see you. Um, so if you um, have been on the Facebook page, that's my dog barking, sorry about that. If you have been on the Facebook page this afternoon, I put a poll. Keep in mind that a poll is when I ask you your opinion and I asked what was your level. So if you haven't answered yet this poll, put in comments just below what is your level? What do you think is your level? Um, we have three main level in English, main levels, sorry, in English. We have beginner, intermediate and advanced. And in between those two levels, hi Ellen, it's good to see you here. Welcome back. Um, we have two um, sort of two levels in between. So uh, we have lower beginner, beginner, upper beginner, um, low intermediate, intermediate, upper intermediate. So in between you have some sort of um, in between levels, <laughs> if I can be clear. And um, you have this list, which is into um, is is in there is a reference, a European reference to make sure you know what is your level. Low intermediate. Okay, well, this uh, no bad or good level. So I can see your kind of sad smileys. Um, there's really no uh, low is not considered as negative for me. So I really don't consider there's a good or a bad level. Absolutely not. Um, there's only a level. And um, if you are low intermediate or if you are beginner, there's lots of things interesting that you need to discover and lots of things that you can learn. And learning is an amazing and really interesting process. So if you advanced, you have still have things to learn, but um, they are on a different level and different things that you need to learn. So first thing is really accepting that there is no good or bad level. There is just a type of level. And this level is super important to know when you want to start improving, when you want to um, take again the English lessons, um, do an English exam. And to do that, it's important to know what is your starting point. You need to know what is your level, because if you don't know, you're not going to do something adapted. And obviously, knowing your level is helping you to choose the type of lessons you want, choose the type of exam you want, choose the type of job you want. Um, if you think you are a beginner, but maybe you're not, you underestimate your level. You will not apply to interesting job interviews because you consider personally that you don't have the level. And most of the time you underestimate your level and you're totally capable of doing this job because they need just people who can send emails or um, talk on the phone for five minutes we talked about job interview last week, so for those who haven't seen the live last week, you can watch them on replay in the video section. And we talked about how to get ready for a job interview in English. Um, so I'm not going back on this subject. So I definitely recommend you to watch this 
um, replay as soon as you can. It's very easy to find video section on the page and you will find it. Um, second thing you need to know about level, well, knowing about your level is the categories. So it starts from A1 and finishes in C2. So you literally have A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. And that's the sort of intermediate levels you have in between. So A1 and A2 are considered as beginner. Um, B1, B2 intermediate, C1, C2 um, are ed, sort of advanced level. Um, and those, um, this list is um, kind of, if you have references, this reference is based on um, the competencies. What are you capable of doing? And when you think about that, there are lots of things you can do in a language. And definitely a test where you have just a writing part, just a speaking part, or just a listening part is not enough. Um, it's not because you do one test, one time on with, I don't know, 10 questions that it tells you exactly what is your level. Um, has to, it has to be very complete and include for the four main skills that I already mentioned before, has to include listening, reading, writing, listening, reading, writing, and speaking, sorry. Uh, listening, writing, reading, speaking. And those four are essential. If you don't make a test with those four, it's partial test, partial level test. Um, so the European um, reference are available on my website. So if you want to know more about it, you have a link just above this video that you can click right after the live. This live is always available in replay. So if you want to listen again, and I recommend you to click on the link just above the video on my website where you can see, uh, where you can understand the different type of levels. And I offer you a free level test which is not um, a complete level test. It's obviously just an online quiz, but it can give you approximately an idea about what is your level. And you can also have a second level test, which will be speaking, speaking and listening by taking a free trial lesson. A trial means try. So you try, this is a free first lesson. So in um, you can have something pretty complete by um, doing the test online that you can have on my website and scheduling a free live, free online lesson with me, not live, this is the live, um, which is a face-to-face, -face, you really do a lesson for 20 to 30 minutes with me. And in this period of time, I can tell you a little bit more about your speaking level and listening level. Right, I move on to possible uh, sort of exams that can help you to define your test, except the one I just uh, put on my website. Uh, but you also have um, sort of official level test. And some of them are pretty famous, like the TOEIC, um, the TOEIC, the TOEFL, the LILATS, the IELTS. They are all level tests. And a lot of people don't consider them as a level test, but they, they do, they are level test. And they uh, really help you to define a level test in particular situations. Uh, for example, the TOEIC is a level test for business type of English. So if you have an English which is very general every day and you want a level test to travel, definitely not the TOEIC. Um, so choosing your level test will also depend on your um, objectives, on your needs, on the English you already have. And um, those tests can also be prepared. And I, I'm not sure this is a great way to know your level, even if I still recommend them, but um, they are pretty expensive. 
and uh, but they're good because they're official so you have like a sort of paper to tell you um, they have this person has this level um, but for example the TOEIC you have different type of TOEICs and you will have the TOEIC where you have only reading and listening and this one definitely will tell your level only for listening and reading and not for speaking um, so if, if you choose the TOEIC listening and reading is cheaper but you don't have you don't have a complete level test and it's um, I've in my experience as a teacher I've had students who had an amazing level at the TOEIC like nearly the best so considered a C1 C2 level and when it was time to have a conversation they were very uncomfortable didn't feel it didn't feel like it was a C1 or C2 level for me and it's it's a bit problematic I think it's a kind of a problem uh, when you actually do this kind of test and you consider by the end you will know exactly what is your level I'm not sure hi Han it's good to see you um, I'm not sure it's actually really reliable uh, depending on what type of exams you do and it's only valid for two years because your level keeps changing all the time um, if you don't practice for two years your level is definitely going to drop down and if you practice a lot for two years your level is going to go up so um, you need to to know your level you need to constantly kind of test it and uh, see in different situations um, where you're improving where you are not improving um, so knowing your level is not something fixed is really something that has to be tested pretty regularly um, but um, there, there are really specific um, references and criteria that uh, can officially define um, your level for example you are capable of um, speaking in any sorts of situation answer to any sorts of problems um, and um, using complex grammar um, that's the kind of things that will define your level um, one of the um, exams that I really like is the IELTS because it's really so IELTS it's I-E-L-T-S and this exam is pretty complete and this is kind of a full version um, compared to the TOEIC which is more a sort of marketing thing um, and it's private uh, the IELTS is from the British Council so it's more of an a sort of an official level test so I think it's a little bit more reliable than the TOEIC or the TAFL which are literally marketing and it's a money industry so much um, but that's that's really something that you need to take into account um, to know your level um, I think I've said quite a lot of things in a few minutes um, so I don't know if you have any questions um, it's a live lesson so please do not hesitate to write your question just under in the comments concerning your level um, really there are tons of things you need to consider um, but you have to think um, first what is the best for you to uh, know your level depending on what sort of situation uh, because it's not um, because you have a huge amazing level um, in um, traveling like you're really capable of traveling using English you are completely independent um, it doesn't mean you can negotiate and do business in English it's a completely different type of vocab so um, the level will be sort of different you can also have a pretty good level in um, reading and writing which is most of the time the case of most French people thanks to school system um, but a pretty low level in um, in speaking for example so this is why I consider that knowing your level doesn't mean knowing if you're capable of reading and writing but if you're capable of reading writing speaking and listening and that's that has to be complete and most of the time they kind of go sort of go together they 
have to be together. Um, so I have a question. What about the Lilats? The, um, so the Lilats is, um, I'm not really surprised about your question. Uh, the Lilats is sort of a brand new um, exam and it's, it's private, like Toei Can Tuffle, uh, but it's opening to the market because it's really less complicated than the Toei. Uh, there is no really preparation. Uh, the preparation for the two-week is a real business of method. Um, you, I, I think you need six months preparation, full intensive or, or three months minimum um, to be ready for the two-week. And you need to be logic in why you take the two-week. But the Lilats, it's more about being able, of, being able to communicate in English and it's mainly speaking. Um, so in a way, it's practical because it's um, a Skype conversation, it's only conversation, and um, it's easier in terms of um, preparation, method, and it's just more practical. Um, you talk for with a person for 30 minutes and um, and that's it. And that person will judge what is your level by the way you speak. Um, so it can be a little bit stressful and you can raise a lot of other problems by just uh, judging with the level when you speak. But I I personally think that it's it's better to decide what is your level with the speaking because um, if you had to choose like in between um, the two week, which is all about reading and the two week reading and listening part, um, where it focuses on things where you can take the time to think and well, sort of, because the two week is still pretty fast. But when you speak, I think when you're capable of speaking, when you can have a conversation, you can write. Um, but the other way round is more complicated. So if you can write an email, it doesn't mean you can answer the phone. But if you can answer the phone, it logically takes less time to write an email. Um, so I think the Lilats is good for that reason because the speaking part is for me the most important. I really focus on the speaking on my lessons um, because I really think that it just kind of creates. And most of the time, as a French person, you had a, a huge preparation on the writing and reading. Um, so the speaking part is the most difficult one. So if you show up in a company and say, hey, I've got the Lilats, I'm capable of having a conversation. I think it's easier to uh, kind of sell it and sell yourself to the job interview than with a TOEIC where most companies just know the name TOEIC, but they don't know what they actually test you about. Um, so I don't know if I really answer your question here. I'm trying to be as complete as possible. But um, Lilette is good for a, a lot of practical things, but also because in it's kind of a more logic um, sort of test, even if I still think it's not fully telling your level. Um, I don't know. If, if I haven't answered completely your Oh, it's clear. Perfect. Um, good. <laughs> um, if you have any other questions, you do not hesitate. If um, you're watching this live in replay, I can still answer the questions uh, in replay. So I'll do just put in comments and I will answer not on the live, but I will answer directly on the comments. Um, I think that's pretty much you're welcome. I'm glad if I helped. Um, if you have any other question, you do not hesitate. I think I've said that before, just repeating myself. Um, so one last thing I repeat, just above this video, when this live will be finished, I recommend you to click on the link direct to my website. You have an explanation, a full detailed explanation about the different test, um, different uh, levels, not the test, the different levels. If you are interested in uh, taking a um, lesson with me, that's a free first lesson. So I can give you um, an, um, a sort of my opinion about your level when you speak. Uh, the test is online, so it takes about 30 to 60 minutes depending on people. So you need to be kind of concentrate and you need to take the time. Um, just don't think too much, do the quiz, 
answer the question, go to the next one. Don't think too much about what possible answer it is. Um, and that's that's pretty much. Uh, just a reminder, I do a live lesson every Wednesday, 8 p.m. on this Facebook page. If you like the live, click the like button and click share to share the good things to your friends that might be interested in this lesson. And you also have available lots of Hello, hello, and welcome back on this live lesson from the Frenches Speak English. Um, as usual, you can join me every Wednesday at eight o'clock on this Facebook page. And welcome, if, you're, if it's the first time for you to join me, welcome here. And if you're coming back and it's not your first time, welcome back. I'm very happy to do all this live every week and it's really, um, an interaction so I need you to put comments just uh, just below this video anytime you have a question you answer my questions because sometimes I can ask you questions as well and um, today's video it's about French and English so um, most of the time I don't tell my students to refer to the French language because referring to the French is not really helping you so most of the time if you translate words or if you think French and then you directly put your sentence the same way than in French but in English 99% of the time it's not working but still there is 1% well for me this is not really exact science I'm saying but there is a little chance for you to actually use words that you already know and that's a super super easy um, list of words that you can actually remember because it's all French words and yes we can use some French words in English in some situations and obviously that's the same in reverse so you can definitely use some English words in French such as weekend which is an English word, but we say that word in French. So the evolution of languages um, today is that we still use a lot of, all the languages are related. And in particular languages who take their reference from their origin, from um, Latin words. And the invasions, the wars, history has, has made that some languages are connected to each other and some words are used in other languages but copied exactly from the original uh, language which is here English. Hi Ellen, it's good to see you. Welcome back on this live. It's been a long time I haven't seen you connected last time you were late so it's good today you're just arriving on time perfect. Um, so there are really some words that you can totally use and what is even funnier is that they are literally exactly the French words. So, for example, in English, you never have any accents that we can put in in French above the e, or above the the, the letter e, or above um, a. Like we have the two points, uh, which doesn't exist in English. There's no accent in English. I mean, accent above letters. Uh, obviously, there are some accents, pronunciation accent, but there's no accent above letters. So, um, but the French word that you can use in English have their accent. So it's literally the French word, which makes things so easy for you to remember and use them. So before we start, I want to know if you know any words in French that we can use in English. Probably, Ellen, you know some of them because I think in lesson we talked about that. And there are really some words that you can reuse. Can you can you think of words that you have in mind? Maybe it's uh, there are on my list. Um, I didn't make a full list of all the French words that you can find in English, obviously, because that would take ages, and that would be a very long life to do. So I just made a list of twelve words, twelve words that you can take from the French language and directly use it in English. The only trick is that you have to use tell them with a little English accent but that makes it very sexy I think and that makes it very fun to actually use the word that you use to talk with a 
French accent, but with a little English accent, that makes it very, very fun, actually. So, have you got in mind any words in French that you can reuse in English? I'm going to start with a pretty easy one, and it's something um, that you, you can totally hear in films and in a lot of different situations. It's the word cafe. So I'm actually going to write after this live in the description I will write down all the words I'm mentioning in this live. So if you watch this live in replay you will see just above the video the the vocab but I haven't put it in advance. Um, I'll just say it during the live. So first one is a cafe and cafe yes with an accent on the e um, which is not a coffee. So you have a difference between coffee, which is the drink, and a cafe, which is um, the cafe is the place. That's the building where you go and drink a coffee. Um, money. Money is French? I don't think so. Oh, I know what you're talking about. This is like, no, in English that would be cash or, um, but not money. It's not a French word. It's it's actually an English word. Um, but good try. Good try. Ha try to have another one. Try to think about other words. So cafe is really um, the building where you, you, you drink your coffee. So we go to the cafe. Starbucks is a cafe. Uh, oh, money. Like, yeah, but it's not exactly. Here I'm really literally thinking about the words the exact word in French, like cafe, reused exactly the same way with the same spelling in English. So money, there's an influence probably, uh, but it's not exactly what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, but I understand how you were thinking, how you, how, how you, you proposed your example. I understand your example now. Um, Thank you for that. But it's it's not really, here I'm really talking about words with the exactly same spelling. So cafe with the accent, um, it's the French word completely used in English. Um, another one, which you, you might not use that word very often, but it's a massage. And massage, it's exactly the same than in French. And it means the same thing. So this one is not like cafe coffee. Um, this one, massage, is a massage. And um, you can say, I'm going to have a massage. And just make it very sexy with the English accent. Massage. So I recommend you to repeat this word after me. I can't hear you. But you can comment to me if it's easy to pronounce or not. Massage. This sounds so sexy, I think. <laughs> anyway, um, next one is very common. It's actually super common in... UK and probably US, um, which is bon appetit. And yes, you pronounce all the letters. You need to say bon appetit. Sounds very strange in English to a French person, but that's how you need to say it. Because if you say the French bon appetit, mm, not sure English people will understand what you're saying. So you really have to say bon appetit. And that sounds very English now. And that's is in English. That is a word used in, well, two words used in English. And it literally means the same. So bon appetit, you say that before starting lunch, before starting dinner, before eating. Um, that's literally exactly the same use. And um, you can also say have a good lunch, enjoy your meal. But I think they like using the bon appetit because it sounds it sounds French. So basically, I think anything in relation with food, you have a lot of chances to use French word for food because we are the reference in food. Let's be honest. But no, seriously, um, when you have food vocab there in restaurant and in supermarket, you have a lot of words that are taken from um, French. So in cooking, well, in food or cooking and in dancing. But dancing, I didn't really mention here because I don't think you're gonna use dancing vocabulary like pas de beret or things like this, I'm not sure. Oh, courgette, yeah, that's a good one. That's an excellent one. I'm, um, courgette, and well, unfortunately, it's just for British. So courgette 
That's the French word. I didn't think about this one. Thank you for this example. Courgette is British, and that's a vegetable, which is the courgette, the French courgette. Same word. But in the US is zucchini. Well, that's not fun in the US. You can remember the British one. So, bon appetit, that's my number three. Number four, it's déjà vu. Déjà vu or déjà vu, depending on people, how they pronounce it. And again, this one is the same meaning. So, when you have this déjà vu, it means that it's a situation that you have the impression you have lived before. Um, you feel like, oh, I have a feeling of déjà vu or this is a déjà vu situation. And... And that's it, yeah, that's exactly the same thing in French. There's nothing magical about this, but it's literally déjà vu. And same with the two accent on the E and the A. So you literally take the French expression in English with English accent. Next one, my number five, this is chic. It's very chic. And no, you don't say chic, because chic is a different word. Um, but you say chic because here they try. Yes, good, Ellen. Oh, perfect timing. You just said that at the same time that I actually saw your comment. So there's probably a little bit of time before you hear what I'm saying. But it was a perfect timing for me. I saw your comment at the same time that I was talking about chic. So perfect. Um, chic is same. It's very chic, very classy, very beautiful um, this is a this is exactly the same use most of the words are the same use in English and in French some are a little bit different like cafe and there's another one after in my list which is a little bit different but most of them are pretty much the same meaning than French and English so very chic um, next one is food again and this is a la carte a la carte, um, which is literally a la carte. So when you ha when you go to the restaurant and, hi Dan, it's good to see you. For those who are connected, do not hesitate to say hello. I'll be very happy to say hello to you. Um, a la carte is when you go to the restaurant and you have a menu and you can choose a menu, so a two or three course um with in, well including um i'm going into another direction here sorry uh but a la carte is when you choose out of the specific menu including three courses like uh, main course and dessert for example a la carte is you choose just what you want as uh, so you choose just one um one starter one main course or just the main course and it's a la carte so it's not part of a full, not menu, because menu in English is the, the paper you open, but uh, a two or three um, course um, is, um, is not a la carte. So when it includes two or three things at the same time, a la carte is individual selection. But still the same word in French, a la carte. And it happened to me a lot of time that I saw this word on menus in the UK or in other countries. I'm not sure it's used only in the UK, by the way. I think in other countries, like, I'm just thinking about maybe Sweden or, but I'm sure you can see, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can see um, this word a la carte in probably in other countries, not just in, in English speaking countries. Um, literature, yes, yes. But in English, it's without the accent. So literature and is, yes, I know you like this word because of the pronunciation, literature. So um, I don't think it's, it's it, we actually use the same word, but it's not exactly the same spelling because we don't have the accent. But yeah, that's, that's actually a good one. Next is one of the words that is not exactly the same meaning, English or French. It's a chef. And you write like French, so C-H-E-F, but a chef is not the French... Well, in French, we use it in two different contexts. We use it as the boss or the manager, um, but it's also the person who cooks in a restaurant. And that's, that's this one that the English people use it for. So a chef is a person uh, who cooks 
in a good restaurant because in English you can say a cook. A cook is just a person who can cook and it's it can be in a restaurant but it's not a very high standard type of restaurant. But a chef is for Gordon Ramsay is a chef, for example. Um, and a cook is more a person who, yeah, I'm, for example, I can say I'm a cook because I, I can cook food. Um, so um, it's, it's also a job, obviously, but it's not on the same type of level. So really the fact that they use the French word, it means that it's, it's more chic. Like I just said before, it's, it sounds French, so it, it means it's better quality. So this is why they, they associate it to a um, higher level of job. Next one is entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is really, uh, I love this word, entrepreneur. Uh, but that's, that's actually a French word. And they use it for the same meaning. So an entrepreneur is a person like me, who creates a company. So I created my own company as independent. So I'm an entrepreneur. And that sound so cool in English, much more than in English, in French, much more than in French. And it's funny because in French today, we use the word freelance um, or well, I'm freelance because I'm independent. But an entrepreneur is, is larger than freelance. It's, it's just a CEO. So CEO is chief executive officer. That's my dog, sorry. Chief executive officer. So it's literally big boss. So entrepreneur is a creative person who created a company. But French word again. Right, another one, which is a fiancé. And yes, you put the accent on the E. My fiancé is the person you're going to get married to, but you're not married yet. So same again than in French. And it sounds very um, beautiful in English, my fiancé. Try really to pronounce at the same time. That's really funny to pronounce at the same time. My fiancé. <laughs> um, another one which actually finished with the same E, eh, which is a cliché. Cliché, yes cliche is French and used in English. This is so cliche and yes and when you say that you sound cliche <laughs> but um, a cliche is a stereotype um, something that you expect too much to see. This is so cliche of oh, nothing original there. Same meaning than in French again. Okay, two more words and then we're done for this uh, list. Uh, next one, is, it's used quite a lot, but there's an equivalent. So um, it's bon voyage, bon voyage. Sometimes they say bon voyage, depending on people, if they know how to pronounce it in French. Uh, it's like the bon appetit. Um, bon voyage, it's literally have a good trip. Um, so you can have people saying have a good trip. Or bon voyage. It depends. I don't know if American actually say bon voyage. Probably more British than American. But I quite like this one. I think it's a cute one. And there it is. This is the last one. So this is number 12 uh, on my list. And this is a chauffeur. A chauffeur. And a chauffeur. You write it the same way than in French. So C H A U double F. E U R and the chauffeur is the person who drives you somewhere. So if you take an Uber, it's a chauffeur. Um, not taxi, because for taxi you would say taxi driver. But a chauffeur is you can have a personal chauffeur, so a person who drives you whenever wherever you want. Um, and again, I think it really has this sort of classic vision chic. Sort of. I think they really use the, the French in a lot of cases for specific things like food, um, which is really associated to our culture. And, um, and they also use it for sort of very posh. I don't know if you know posh, but posh or snobbish kind of things. And you sound 
always like aristocratic when you use French.、Um, I think we do the same with English.、Uh, today in French, when we use English, it sounds a little bit cooler. Like you use English, you sound very cool.、Um, in the UK, if you use French, you sound intelligent, and I don't know. <laughs> it's quite a well. It's very common. So all the words I just told you tonight are super common in the UK. So for those who join me after, like in the middle of the list, I'm just going to repeat the list. And you can still watch this video on replay, so you can repeat after me and practice. There's no need to understand them except two that don't have exactly the same meaning, but all the others have the same meaning than in French. So it's super super easy to remember, super easy to use. So my first one was cafe, massage, bon appetit, déjà vu, chic. À la carte, chef, entrepreneur, fiancé, cliché, bon voyage, and chauffeur. That's it for today. So this was today's video.、Um, as usual, I make a video every Wednesday, eight o'clock. So you just need to join. No need for a Facebook account. It's totally free. And it's interaction, so I'm always very happy to see when you talk to me, and I can answer your comments.、Um, you can watch all the replays directly on this Facebook page. It will be soon available on my website, but I'm updating it. So soon, I will put all the replays directly on my website, so you can see them anytime you want, and it's easier on the website than on the Facebook page.、Um, I just remind you that I'm an English online teacher, and If you want to go on holiday this summer, English is essential. So you can join me directly on my website. Book an online lesson. The first time is one hundred percent free. It's on Skype or on telephone, and I can help you to travel feeling comfortable using English and practicing English at home and enjoying it. I wish you an amazing evening, and I will talk to you next week because next week we are talking about. Hello guys.、Um, I don't know if this live is working. I've been trying to start this live three times.、Um, so if you're here,、uh, please say hello, put a comment, or just tell me if this live is actually working. I'm terribly sorry. Technology sometimes, you know, can not always work the way you want.、Uh, so I hope you can get this live and join me.、Uh, today we are talking. Grammar, and apparently this live doesn't seem to be on live.、It、seems to be working on my phone now, but doesn't seem to be working here. Oh, sounds apparently it's good.、Um, right, so I'm gonna wait a few seconds for you to connect、um, because you are probably trying to find me right now because it was not working. And right, so today we are talking. Verbs and that's grammar. So I'm, I'm really going to try to make it simple and easy to remember, and I'm going to try to help you to understand them and use them properly. Because what happens in grammar most of the time is that people think too much and、um, compare to French or to the native language, and this is where you get confusion, and this is where you just don't understand things. So.、Um, Let's get started with、um, what is an adverb. What are the adverbs? And I'm asking you the question. So I have some people live now.、Um, can you tell me for you what is an adverb? So I don't want a definition. I just want、um, an example. Maybe、um, if you have a definition, that's actually perfect. But I'm not asking you that much.、Uh, do you know? Can you give me an example of? An adverb. So I don't know if I can see the comments. I'm trying.、Um, so, any examples of adverbs you're thinking about for the ones who are live? If you are watching this video in replay, do not hesitate to comment down below. Even in replay, no problem. I'll see your comments and I can still answer and interact with you. It's just writing instead of speaking directly on the video. Um, so, 
I give you an example. Um, you have clearly, quickly, automatically, and I have, I actually have examples which I forgot to prepare before. Well, I sort of prepared, but I closed my book, which is very stupid of me because I had a class just before. Um, so just one second, I just open where I had some examples for you. But most of the time, what you have to remember is that to recognize an adverb is um, occasionally, yeah, occasionally is a very good example. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and as you can see, quickly, badly, suddenly, carefully, occasionally, if you have other examples, uh, do not hesitate to write them down. And most of the time, you can notice that they finish with li, uh, l l y. And that's a good way for you to um, see if it's an adverb or an adjective, because most of the time people confuse adverbs and adjectives. Um, but there is a pretty big difference between the two. Um, and the adverbs um, helps you to know how this action happened. Um, for example, if you say the, the train stopped suddenly, you hear you um, describe how the action happened. Um, um, but if you want to use an adjective, you would say the train was quick. And you're just describing, you're just giving an information about the train. But if you say the train stopped suddenly, you really focus on the manner, how that happened. Um, Give another, another example, I opened the door slowly. So that's how I opened the door. And again, it's Lee. And that's the French mot, um, kind of an equivalent, even if I generally tell you don't take an equivalent in French. But if that can help you to remember that you always have this kind of ending, um, li, um, that can help you. Obviously, you have different types of adverbs, and I'm giving you the general ones. But if you think about adverbs of frequency, which are um, always, never, ever, um, uh, often, sometimes, uh, those are um, adverbs of frequency, and they don't function exactly the same way. So here I'm not talking about adverbs of frequency, I'm just talking about adverbs that describe the manner, so they describe how. Um, <clears throat> right, so um, generally I would tell you the uh, best way to do that is to, ex well, to um, think about adjectives as well, so kind of compare them. Um, I will give you some um, examples uh, where you can compare the two. For example, Sue or, I don't know, uh, Jane is uh, very quiet. Uh, what do you think? Quiet is an adjective or an adverb? Can you write down in the comments? Adjective or adverb? I repeat the sentence. Um, Jane is very quiet. What do you think? I think there's a little time between the moment I speak and the moment you actually listen um, for the connection, so I'm not sure you're going to be able. Um, okay, adjective. Adjective. Can I have other people trying to tell me if it's adjective or adverb? I got one one answer. Adjective as well. Okay, sounds good. Okay, that's perfect. So yeah, it's it's an adjective that gives you an information about Jane. But if I say um, Jane speaks very quickly. Is this one an adjective or an adverb? Jane speaks very quickly. Adverb or adjective? Quickly. Or quietly. I can change that to use the same word, quietly. Adjective to, adverb, uh -huh. 
adverb, right? Yeah, so Hélène and Florence, you are right, that's adverb. That's an adverb here because you describe how she speaks and she speaks quickly or quietly. Um, another example, be careful, adjective or adverb, be careful. This one can be a little bit tricky, be careful, adverbs or adjective. <laughs> That's good, yeah, you did good. So she, uh, listen, uh, be careful, oh, be careful, sorry, forgot my, okay, adjective with be careful, Hélène, okay, can I have other people trying to answer this one, be careful, adjective, okay, let's try to see if I have another try. Well, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's adjective. Be careful is an adjective. But can you try to write down an equivalent of the sentence, but saying with an adverb? So can you try to find another way to say be careful or change the verb? Use listen. If you take the verb listen, can you transform with listen but using an adverb. So I don't want listen careful. What do you say? What will be the adverb in the sentence? Leave you a little bit of time to think. It's actually pretty slow, the connection. Okay, I have listen carefully. Oh, so I'm so sorry, Priscille. Um, I think you didn't start the video from the beginning, so it's a bit hard to follow me now. But um, I want you to try to understand, well, try to transform careful, which is an adjective, to an adverb. So transform careful to an adverb. And generally, adverb finish with li, like quickly, quietly, fast, um, um, carefully, heavily. So can you transform careful with li? Listen carefully. Okay, very good. I got some good answers. Listen carefully. So here you see carefully is an adverb. And there's a big difference between um, what was my first example? Yeah, be careful and listen carefully. Careful here, really, it's an adjective, it's a situation. Um, carefully is the manner, how, how you should listen. Okay, that's good, Priscille. I hope you will understand this lesson. I'll, it's, it's not always easy to do um, grammar lesson in English, um, but I try to make it simple and easy to understand. Um, Right, another example. Mm. Here, um, I have some special ones. You have sometimes some words which can be um, used for adverbs and adjective. Can you think, I give you one, and you have in total four. Can you think of the three others? So I give you the first one, which is hard. Um, Jane's job is very hard. She works very hard. So you can't say hardly. Which actually hardly exists, but it's not an adverb. Here, um, she works very hard. That's the adjective. And um, her job is, no, sorry, her job is very hard is the adjective. And she works very hard is the adverb. Can you think of three other words that you can use as adjectives and adverbs?
<laughs> you're scared about my question yes yes it's a bit difficult question i want you to try to be imaginative um i give you the first letter the next one is with an f uh, you have another one with an l and another one with an e that's the first letter Mm hmm so first one I'm gonna write it down you have one with F one with uh, what did I say F L and another word with E fast yeah very good so the first one is fast yes you don't say fast Lee you say fast so, um, for example, Ben is a fast runner. That's the adjective. Um, ben can run fast. That's the adverb. What about L? Mm, not long, because long is really just an adjective. You um, uh, long and easy. That's that's very good um, try, but unfortunately, that's not the right one. Can you try another one starting with L? that you imagine you can put in a sentence where you have an adjective and adverb, like I did with fast. Um, he is a fast runner and he runs fast. Can you think of a, another one that you can use with L, which is not long, but another one. Low, nope, but good try. Um, it's the contrary of, oh, no, <laughs> actually, if... I don't know if you can see me, can you tell me if you see me? Cause my connection is a bit bad. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Are you here? Okay, I think yes. Um, so the last two words with um, starting with L and starting with E are the contraries. And it's about time. So there are the contraries. Maybe it's difficult. So the last two words are late and early, late and early. So you have fast, late and um, hard, fast, late and early, which are adjectives and adverbs. Last, no, last is not uh, an adverb, unfortunately, but late, yes. So I'll give you an example. Um, the bus was late early yes very good uh the bus was late uh the bus was early that's the adjective and i went to bed late or early and those are the adverbs um so i hope it's clear here um but most of the time really what is very simple about adverbs is that they finish with lee so remember quickly, badly, suddenly, carefully, um, heavily, happily, um, and well, most of the time you can just get your adjectives and add li and then you got your adverb. Um, that's the basic thing. And they generally are placed after the verb. The train stopped suddenly. I opened the door slowly. Please listen carefully. I understand you perfectly. So all those adverbs are generally in the sentence, they are placed after the verb. Contrary to adverbs of frequency, which are placed before the verb, I always have a live on Wednesday on this page, for example. So this is why I said adverbs of frequency uh, don't have the same rules. Um, so here I'm just talking about adverbs 
about mana. Keep that in mind. Um, right, I think that's it for today. Um, have you got any questions about this lesson? I've tried really to make it as simple as possible. Um, and there's really nothing special to remember about this, except that you just put Lee at the end and four of them um, are sort of irregulars and you just use them differently in the way that you don't add any, you just use the same words, so it's not that hard to remember. Um, but that's pretty much about the adverbs. Um, so have you got any questions? Is it clear? Do you understand now how and when to use adverbs after this live? Wait for you a little bit to answer because the time my connection gives me the answer, it's a bit long. Less or more? What do you mean? Is it a question? Less or more um, are not uh, considered as adverb. I suppose this is your question. Oh, good. That's good. If you understand, I'm happy. Sorry. What is? The, oh, there's no question. I'm asking you. Do you have questions? And uh, I, I don't have a question uh, for you. It's actually, do you have questions? before I end up this live. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop it here. Um, if the connection is really bad, um, you can still watch this in replay. Um, all is right for me. Oh good, that's perfect. Okay, I hope you learned something new tonight and or maybe that you understood a little bit better. Um, why do you say we're dead? Uh, do you mean like in English or do you talk about the connection? Um, so I really hope that you enjoyed tonight's lesson. Um, next week, this is a special live next week and I want you to join me and cook with me. So I'm basically going to cook um, live. Um, I love cooking and I think that could be a great opportunity for you to know a little bit more about cooking verbs and uh, verbs or just vocabulary about the food I'm going to cook. Um, I don't know what I, I'm. I don't know yet what I'm going to cook. But next. Hello, good evening, and happy Valentine's Day. Today is February the fourteenth, and I'm doing a live. It's a coincidence because I do my live every Wednesday around eight o'clock, and today is Valentine's Day, so it's kind of a good pre. Well, a good excuse excuse for me to give you some love vocabulary and that's a pretty good coincidence and um, so I do a live if you first hear first time here I do a live lesson which is totally free on Facebook every Wednesday 8 o'clock so uh, you generally receive uh, an invitation if you are my friend on Facebook if you're not just follow my page and I will publish every Tuesday what is the next um, subject for the live. So today's live is all about Valentine's Day and it's all about talking about love, how to express love. So in this video, um, as you can see in this description, uh, you will discover different ways to say the famous I love you because I love you. It's kind of easy and everyone knows it. Hi, welcome on this new life. And it's um, it's, so we will discover new ways to say I love you and um, so I'll try to give you some sort of categories and try to help you to remember them. And a uh, second part of the live is a quiz about Valentine's Day and quiz about 
uh, Valentine's Day in the world and in history. So let's see what you know about Valentine's Day. So my first question is really asking you, can you say I love you in a different way? Can you think of other ways to, to say I love you? And uh, by the way, there's something when you're thinking about other expressions. Um, there is also in the description a link for a blog post. So I've uh, taken all the expression I'm going to mention today in this live. I've put them all in a blog post on my website. So you can totally uh, click on this link after this video and kind of recap and see all the expressions I'm going to mention here. So um, the first category is really a sort of synonym or um, another way to say I love you and it's really just being honest, get, telling your feelings in, in English. So um, a, one of the direct, direct synonym that I would say for I love you is I adore you and it's kind of as strong as I love you but it's also a good way um, I suppose you can always say that to, to friends, um, which you can also say I love you to friends, but um, I adore you. Yeah, it's it's another, sort of another dimension. It's kind of difficult to explain because feelings are sort of hard to explain, but um, I adore you is also a way to say I love you. Um, I'm totally into you. I'm totally into you is same synonym. I love you from the bottom of my heart. I love you from the bottom of my heart. This is kind of a long sentence, but it's just so romantic and it just says so many things about love. I'm yours is also a good way to say I love you. Um, I'm yours, it's kind of possessive a little bit, but it's totally fine when you talk about love. And, and the last one that you can hear quite a lot in films is uh, I'm in love with you. So this one is sort of um, kind of declaration. You kind of declare your love to the person you you love and you say I'm in love with you. So here it doesn't mean that the person loves you back but um, it's a way to express your feeling. Obviously when you say I love you it doesn't also mean that the person loves you back. Right now um, the second category is when you want to say a compliment to your lover so you kind of want to say something nice but um, it's not a synonym for I love you it's just a really a way to express the love you feel or feelings you have for this person you can say for example only to men you are my prince charming prince charming um, very princessy fairy tale type of talking um, but it's pretty common. You might prince charming is pretty common. So uh, obviously you will have the contrary for women. You will say you are my princess, which is kind of exactly the same, but for women only. Uh, the only difference is that when you say you're my prince charming, prince and charming have a capital letter. But when you say you're my princess, there's no capital letter. I suppose it's because Prince Charming is taken from fairy tales and literature, so this is probably why you got this capital letter thing. Um, probably has nothing to do with the fact that it's only for men. I'm just saying. And um, what did I say? Oh, your mind is it's kind of the same than I'm yours is also sort of possessive, uh, but your mind is yeah it's something pretty common as well and the last one which I really like is you're my everything you're my everything it means really like there's nothing better than you and you're my everything well just tells you everything you're my everything that means a lot um, right so now our third category it's when you talk about the couple when you talk about the relationship um, so here we are, instead of I or you, you will more use we because you're talking about the relationship. So we are meant for each other. We are meant for each other. Um, you can also say we are a good match. We are a good match means like we're kind of perfect together. 
and we complete each other. We complete each other is also a very good expression. Now, uh, fourth category. What if you want to reveal this love to this person, but this person doesn't know you uh, love her or him? Um, there are some expressions to not say directly, I love you, but kind of express it a little bit differently. Like you, you kind of want to make it smoothly a little bit more. Um, I think of you as more of a friend. I think of you as more of a friend. So basically your friend, but a little bit more than that. Um, I've got a crush on you. Um, you, you probably heard that in films. They, they use that word a lot. Well, that's that expression a lot. Um, I've got a crush on you. Have you ever heard this expression? Um, they kind of say that a lot in films when they talk about children and they have a crush on another girl. Um, or another boy. Um, so I'm curious, have you, all the expressions I'm telling you here, do not hesitate to, to put in comments when you've heard them before and if you knew what they meant, uh, if you knew that it was all about love. So I have a crush on you. I think I'm in love with you is also a way to say I love you but I don't really know. So I kind of, I say it, but if you tell me that you don't love me back, then it's okay. Um, I think you are the one. This one is pretty strong. I think you're the one because means you the the love of my life. So it means it's much stronger than I have a crush on you. Um, because I have a crush on you is like mm, I really like you, and but I don't know what I can do with it. Uh, and I think you're the one means you're the person I want to live for the rest of my life, and I want to spend my life with you, having kids and things like this. Um, right, so let's pretend now that you have been together for a long time and you want to express love, but obviously you are a little bit less passionate than the first years, um, which doesn't mean you don't love as much as the first day, but you probably a little bit less passionate in the words you're going to use. So you can definitely use you're my sweetie or you are my darling, uh, you are my sunshine. Um, here are lots of different alternatives. I'm giving you this one, but obviously there are lots of other alternatives. So you're my sunshine, you're my darling and you're my sweetie are kind of nice. You can also say you are my other half. So remember half, it's uh, two parts, one half, second half. So you mar, you're, sorry, you're my other half means that um, I can't live without you. So it's kind of very romantic and good for old couples. Um, so on the link I just put uh, above this video, uh, there are two extra videos which are not mine. There are extracts from um, two series that I particularly love. They are extract from Big Bang Theory and uh, Friends. And it's it's all about love. So I know that, uh, well, I, I consider that watching films and series are great for um, vocab. So, and it's good for uh, entertainment. So I just put two extracts um, extra. So after this video, you can totally continue to listen to some English. It's two short videos about like one or two minutes. So it's good extra practice. Let's move on to the quiz about Valentine's Day. So my first question. So obviously, um, as, um, as usual, if you're not watching this video on live, you can still answer the quiz, uh, but I will give you directly the answers on the live lesson. Uh, but you can totally take the time to answer. You can press uh, pause every time I ask a question, put it in comments and I will see your answers afterwards. And I can still answer your comments after the video. So if you watch this video on replay, totally fine to still answer the challenge and still answer the quiz. But if you're live, I want you to click on the comment just below an answer to the question. So first question, it's uh, literature, British literature. Which was Shakespeare, Shakespeare's 
most romantic play. So there's a bit of vocab here. A play is um, at the theater and Shakespeare's, um, well, Shakespeare only made uh, plays. So um, this is a story that is played by actors and actress at the theater because obviously uh, when Shakespeare's were writing plays, you didn't have cinema. Um, so which was Shakespeare's most romantic play? So basically the story that he wrote, which was the most romantic one. Do you have any idea? If you replay, press pause, uh, because I'm going to give you the answer. So the answer of this question is Romeo and Juliet. Question two, what kind of flowers are traditionally given to symbolize love? And they are pretty easy, this one. Those are the red roses, red roses. What other gift sometimes go with a bunch of red flowers or red roses? Generally, you don't just give flowers, you also give chocolate. So chocolate go with um, a bunch of flowers or a bunch of red roses. In Japan, what do women give to men on Valentine's Day? And I'm talking about Japan. What do women give to men on Valentine's Day? They only give chocolate, just chocolate. Now, um, I move on to some uh, kind of numbers and it's very interesting. Romeo and Juliet. Yes, I think I, it's, it's a bit long for the time that I'd see your answers. So Romeo and Juliet is correct, but you probably know that because the time you will listen to what I'm saying now, you will, well, it's, there, there's a big difference between uh, the moment I speak and the moment I see your answers. So I'm terribly sorry if you kind of, I see your answers after. Right, so do you know roughly, uh, roughly is a synonym for approximately, uh, the number of cards which are exchanged every year for Valentine's Day in the world. Do you know the number of cards exchanged every year for Valentine's Day? Can you give it a large number? Kind of wait a little bit because um, I know that I'm, I will give you the answer before I see you answer. It's kind of confusing actually. Um, so it's very large number and it's one billion. One billion cards. Not million, but billion. So this is the category above. One billion cards are sent for Valentine's Day just for one day. Um, in England, Valentine's Day is a holiday. When did England officially declare Valentine's Day as a holiday? Can you give me a date? Here I want a year. Uh, when did England officially declare Valentine's Day as a holiday? Which is not in France, unfortunately. I actually don't celebrate. Valentine's Day. By the way, do you celebrate Valentine's Day at the same time? Because I don't. I f feel like it's very, lots of marketing more than anything else. So, so Valentine's Day in the U uh, in the UK was, what well, England, sorry, in England, was officially declared as a holiday in 1537. 1537. So it's 1537. Do you imagine? It's been such a long time. 1537. Uh, which monarch or king declared it as a holiday in 1537? Do you have any idea which king was in England at this period? It was Henry VIII. Hi, Antoine. I'm so happy to see you in this live. Try to answer the question of my quiz. <laughs> Um, so Henry VIII uh, declared Valentine's Day as a um, holiday in England. 
Um, when did cards and chocolates start being mass produced for this occasion? So mass produced, it's like you create a big number of cards, like they need one billion. So obviously they need to create a lot of cards. Um, so they, there's a mass production of cards. And do you know when they started to produce mass um to to have mass production for cards sorry um in england can you give me a year it's a long time ago actually to give you a clue and help you it was 1840 1840 so 1840 1840 they mass produced card for um Card and chocolate, sorry, I said just cards, it's card and chocolate for Valentine's Day. 1880, you were nearly there, um, but I think it's the, f is it the second question? Oh, it's kind of hard, I don't know which question you're answering. I think it's the card, 1840, so you were nearly there. Um, the red rose, um, here it's true or false. The red rose was the favorite rose of Venice the uh, goddess Venus um, and so w was it her favorite the, I mean the red rose was her favorite rose as a true or false and it is true yes this is why Valentine's Day you have lots of red roses uh, which country has banned Valentine's Day? So in a country in the world, Valentine's Day is not allowed. Can you guess which country has decided to ban Valentine's Day? It's a hot country. And it's kind of logic. It doesn't really surprise me when I found this question. I was like, oh, not very surprising. But um, do you have any idea which country has banned Valentine's Day? Well, you can't celebrate Valentine's Day there. Try to wait a little bit to see your answers. Yes, it kind of Emirates, it's kind of large. Um, can you give me the more a more precise country? You are in the good area, but can you give me the um, one country in particular? It's in two words. Because Emirates, I don't think it's a country. It's kind of a region. Um, a gathered of different countries. It's in two words. Qatar? No, that's kind of a good... you really, really not far. Um, it's Saudi Arabia. But that could happen in Qatar as well. Uh, but Saudi Arabia decided to ban um, Valentine's Day. Yeah, Saudi Arabia, good. Um, okay, last question of this live is in South Korea, Valentine's Day starts on the 14th of February and lasts until the 14th of April. Is it true or false? So basically starting on today and finishing, I speak about Fly Emirates, oh, of course. Of course, <laughs> but it's still not a country. <laughs> um, so February the 14th until April the 14th. So basically, um, this is three months. Um, in South Korea, do they celebrate Valentine's Day for three months? Is it true or false? And that will be the last question.
true or false for three months celebration for Valentine's Day? True, yeah, definitely, it's true. In South Korea, they can celebrate Valentine's Day for three months. How surprising. Um, three months is a lot. Um, so would you be uh, able to, well, could you tell me, do you celebrate Valentine's Day? What do you do for Valentine's Day? Um, as you can see, it's pretty late for me and I don't celebrate Valentine's Day because I can't consider that it's, um, you can celebrate love every day. This sounds so cliche, but still, I can't consider that you don't need an excuse to say I love you to the person you, well, to the person you love or uh, to the people you love because you can still celebrate love with family and friends and, um, and I want to celebrate with all my students. So I'm sending lots of love to my students on this day. And, um, and I hope that you are probably celebrating. Hello and welcome back on this live from the French Speak English with the little English box. Um, I'm going to wait a little bit to have people coming in this live. So if you are ready, if you joined already and you're here, I'm trying to manage the light. I'm sorry, it's a bit. Hello. Say hello if you're joining this live. And we're going to be starting in a few seconds. Right, I just open. Right, how are you if you're here? Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining me. This light is horrible. Really trying to have a good light here. Right, so today in this live video, we are talking about, um, hello to everyone who's connecting. I see people connecting. Um, so hello and welcome here. Hi, Ellen, it's good to see you. So in this video, we are going to talk about the top three questions that you can hear in a job interview. And I promise you, this is the kind of question you hear a lot. And, um, uh, but I want to know, uh, maybe some of you are probably not, well, you might not have the intention to change job or you, um, you're not sure to do a job interview, you just want to prepare yourself or do you have a job interview? I'm sorry, my voice is horrible now. <laughs> <coughs> um, so do you have the intention maybe to uh, change your job and working on job interview or do you have a job interview coming soon? So anything in relation with job interview, um, do not hesitate to comment just below, even if you're watching this on replay, Right now it's a live so you can interact with me. You can totally ask me questions. Um, I will um, answer directly um, on the live video. So please do not hesitate to ask. And if you watch this video on replay, hi Han, it's good to see you. Um, and if you watch this video in replay, you can still ask me questions. I'll just not answer in the video, but I will answer um, afterwards on comment. Hello Florence, uh, good to see you. Wow, there's a lot of people connecting. So thank you for coming. And um, so I'll, I've decided to limit to only uh, my top three questions, but obviously there are tons of questions that you can be asked and those are just examples and are pretty common and a lot of people um, can ask you this type of questions. Um, so have you ever had a job in things about life. Oh, and I know why. Um, so it's actually, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to share with that with you. It's because my boyfriend is outside and he needs the key. So how nice is that? So you're going to visit my house at the same time, actually. Got the keys. Right, so um, I'm just going back there. Sorry, just visit. Right, <laughs> sorry for this little stop and interruption in the live. Um, so, in have you? So, my question was: Have you ever had a job interview in English? If you did, please put it just in comments below. Um, tell me, yes, how did it go? Was it good, bad, panic, comfortable, easy? 
difficult. Um, right, just just tell me how you never had. Okay, so um, this is kind of uh, interesting. So if you've never had, how do you imagine it? Uh, do you imagine some questions that people can actually um, ask you in a job interview in English? Okay, I have two people never. Um, so there, there are pretty sort of similar type of questions that you can have in French. But the difference when you actually do them in France is that you have people who don't really speak fluent English. And oh, that's interesting. I have a lot of people who've never had a job interview in English. Um, so what is uh, very interesting is that in France, we are not the best one to speak English. Let's face it. And you see exactly the same when you have a job interview. Um, they generally have, uh, they have needs. They need someone to speak English. But it doesn't mean that the person who is recruiting you can speak fluent English. And this is literally really not the, um, the case. And I've had a lot of job interviews where, obviously, as a teacher, they asked me to speak English. Uh, but not only, I al al also did some uh, job interviews where they didn't ask me to be a teacher. It was in another context, but they could see I could speak English, so they wanted to test me. And sometimes I was just really have so much fun because I could see they didn't know what they were doing and their level was not sufficient to be able to assess my level. Um, so you have to kind of put things into perspective and imagine that the people in front of you probably don't speak fluent English. And on the job uh, description, they probably tell that they need um, someone with fluent English, but sometimes they don't really know the type of English they really need. And I've been into jobs where they asked for fluent English, but they didn't, they only needed someone who could write emails in English. And to do that, you don't need to be fluent. So sometimes do not hesitate to apply for a job where there's um, English. And even if they put fluent, sometimes you can definitely um, call them and ask them what are their needs and why do they need English? Because sometimes if it's just to write three emails during the day, uh, they definitely don't need fluent. So it's important to think about that. And it helps you to feel a little bit more comfortable going to the job interview and feeling like maybe I'm the one for them, even if I'm not fluent. Um, so can you imagine, can you think about a list of um, questions that could exist um, or the, the most simple and logic question they could ask you in English? And seriously, most of the time there are much more easy, well, they, they are much easier than what you think. So can you try to write just below in comments, can you try to write some uh, one question that you think they can ask you. What do you imagine? What is the most common one they can ask you in a job interview to know more about you or to see what is your English level? Um, so try to write down below. I don't want to give you straight away the three, the top three. Well, obviously the um, this is my top three. Um, so it's just a choice. Have you ever negotiate with foreign customer? Yeah, this is a very good one. Um, it's have you ever negotiated with foreign customers? And it's very good because this is exactly the type of question you can have, but it's very specific. So this one uh, is very uh, interesting if you work in the sector, which is your case, Jan. So I understand you ask, you think about this question. Um, but I was thinking about a little bit more common questions because this one is very specific to your sector, um, which is negotiation. Um, where do you learn English? Yes, um, they want to know about your experience with English. Yeah, it's kind of something interesting. Um, it's probably not the first question they can ask you, but definitely part of the um, common questions. 
Can you think of other questions? Maybe I have some people who didn't uh, have a try. So please have a try. Comment below and make one question, one easy question. Or if you can't write a question in English, if it's difficult for you, just maybe write an idea as a subject um, about a question that can be possible. So here we have negotiation. Um, you have learning English. Speaking English, yes, definitely. Uh, do you speak English? Uh, the answer will be very quick and simple, would be yes or no. Um, and what kind of line are you in? Um, what do you mean by line? I'm not sure I understand what kind of line are you in. Uh, trying to see, maybe it's, is it specific or is it a large question? Um, what do you mean by line? That, that's what I ask because it's not very clear for me. I just need maybe a little bit more context. Oh, what kind of sector? Okay. <laughs> it was probably the d dictionary who changed that. Um, what kind of se sector are you in? Yes, absolutely. Um, maybe what kind of sector have you been working in? So you precise a little bit because if you do a job interview, uh, well, it depends. Maybe you're working already, so they ask you about your current job. But if you're looking for a job, um, they might ask you what type of sector did you work in or what type of sector do you want to work in in the future? Right, so that's pretty good. Uh, let's have a look at the my top three. So my really, really, really number one um, that you will have all the time is not really a question, is more a sentence and you have to deal with is tell me about yourself. Tell me about yourself is so common and it's so easy because as I told you at the beginning, some of the recruiters, well, 90% of the recruiters don't speak fluent English. And tell me about yourself is one of the easiest questions ever and they don't need to interact with you. So when they test your level, they don't want to interact with you because most of the time they don't want you to judge them, but they, it's them who judge you. So, um, well, judge, maybe not the good word, but it's assess for a level. So they assess your level, but most of the time they don't want you to know how they speak English, except if they are very confident, but most of the time they are not. So they will ask you a question where they don't need to interact, but just to listen to you. And that makes it so easy for you because it means this is the kind of thing you can prepare in advance. You can prepare yourself with a list of adjectives, a uh, list of things that can describe yourself. Um, think about the positive and the negative. Think about experiences. So you can totally prepare all that part before. Um, and obviously when I mean prepare, I don't mean writing everything. I just mean writing down ideas and vocabulary if you need. But most of the time in a job interview, you will not really have an interaction, but really more like speaking and telling something about yourself. My number two is, could you describe yourself in three words? This one is super easy, um, but this one, it can create interaction. So it depends on the person you have in front of you. And it also depends, of course, on the sector. But can you describe yourself in three words? You can here think about objectives before the job interview. Um, I recommend you to prepare more than three so you are ready to interact maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and they will probably ask you why. So what I recommend you to do when you have this type of question is to have an objective and have an explanation for um, this word. Why do you say that? So being ready to interact about this word and be able to, um, well, to answer and to give a reason why you chose this one in particular. And do not choose just positive, but also maybe a little bit negative things, but explain why and how you can turn it into something positive for them. Uh, sorry, that's okay if you're late, don't worry. Um, you can still watch the replay after for the beginning of the video um, as you missed one part of the video. Um, and my number three is, why do you want to work with us? 
This is a question you can totally hear in French as much as in English, so you can totally prepare yourself for that. Um, and most of the time, when you go to a job interview, you know why you're going there and you know why you want to work in this company. If you don't know why, you shouldn't go to the job interview because you have to be convinced about this job and you shouldn't go just because they um, called you. So in the first place, normally if you, if you sent your CV and your cover letter, it means you were interested in the company, um, but be ready to talk about this in English because it's not because you have the answer in French in your head that you can answer in English. It's not the same. Um, so it's, it's really all a question of preparation, but mm, at the same time, I would say not really, because I don't recommend you to prepare too much. You should prepare ideas, adjectives like vocabulary you need. You can practice with a video. For example, you can record yourself answering a list of questions that you imagine about your job because the question I gave you here are very um, general. So I try to give you something very, very general, but obviously you can have more specific question like the question Rian just asked before about um, negotiation. You can obviously have a much more specific question and only you can think about this type of question because I probably don't think about the type of question you can have in your job. Um, but don't prepare yourself too much because the more you prepare, the more stressed you are on the D-Day because you want to reproduce exactly what you prepared and with stress and with interaction, it's not only, it's not always possible and nearly never. So try to uh, really prepare differently, like having ideas, practicing, but not learning by heart or learning what you have to say. Just remember and prepare yourself to be able to interact and talk about yourself. Well, I think that's pretty much, um, I don't know, if you have any question, do not hesitate to ask them. Um, you can put them in comments below as usual. Um, remember that I do a live lesson every Wednesday around eight o'clock. Sometimes I miss it, but if I miss the live, you will know it. I will just not send any invitation and no e event created, but um, most of the time I create an event so you can see what time, what day, not very difficult to remember. It's every Wednesday, eight o'clock. You just go on the page. Um, I recommend you to get the notification. So if you go on the page, you can have notification from the page. So you know when I'm on live, it's easier uh, for you. You can put a reminder. It's very easy to do. I hope you enjoyed today. It um, it's, was very good to interact with you. So Hello and welcome back on this new life from the French Speak English with the Little English Box. So that's a new life that I do every Wednesday around eight o'clock and I'm always struggling with the light. But as you can see now, we are starting lesson and it's still daylight. So it's not night anymore, so that's nice. But it also means that we have one hour less sleeping and this is something I don't like. Um, so in this lesson, uh, we are going to talk about five French common mistakes and so five French common mistakes that people do in English and they are very, very common and this is mainly mistakes that I hear from my students who are all French people and um, but they are all explained by the uh, French language. So. It's totally normal and there's a reason why you, you use them and I'm going to try to help you. Hi everyone, I see people connected. Thank you for watching. Um, so, um, did you have time to think about uh, mistakes that you um, normally do? Think about common mistakes that you have difficulties to avoid or that you always use and you just don't know why or don't know how but you always make them. Can you try to think of uh, mistakes that you do when you speak French, when you speak English, um, which are related to French? Um, if you have any ideas, try to comment just down below. I will see, uh, even in replay, so I will see your comments just down below. Um, do you have any idea 
of French proper common mistakes. Um, I will list you five today, but obviously um, that's just an extract <laughs> because we have um, a lot of different things uh, that we are using in French and they are actually completely different in English. Um, using adverbs, yes, using adverbs can definitely be a problem in French and English. Um, it's not part of my list, so thank you for mentioning that. The using adverbs in French um, are not in the same place, so most of the time we don't use them correctly in English because we put them at the beginning or at the, the end or in the middle because in French there's not really this um, strict structure that we have in English which is always in relation with um, the verb. So it's where you have your verb, you know where your adverb is, which is just before or just after depending on the verb. So using adverbs, yes, definitely. Um, can you think of other, maybe other common mistakes? Um, maybe a personal mistake that you do. And I try to leave you a little bit of time to think. And Sorry, I see your comments coming, yes. So I will start with my top number one, like the one I hear all the time. Like I think all my students made this mistake at one point whatever the level, seriously, even with um, advanced level, um, all my students have made this mistake minimum one time, um, which is, I am agree. And that's the one I um, use. So if you've been following the page, I asked in a quiz uh, yesterday if you could correct, I am agree, uh, which is literally the translation from the French, je suis d'accord. But in English, it's d'accord is a verb. So you need to say directly, I agree, and not I am agree. Um, I can see, Irian, that you put irregular verbs. Yes, definitely. I think this is that because at school, uh, you've been learning irregular verbs, like a horrible list. I've been through that too, and I definitely don't recommend my students to do that. It's such a stupid idea to learn the irregular verbs with a list. Um, there are tons of games online and I don't understand why teachers keep asking the students to learn by heart a stupid list without being able to use it. Um, and I think it's not really a French mistake, it's more a French school mistake. Um, it's more the method which is bad, this is why we have so many problems to use them because we have never learned how to use them, we just learned them. But learning doesn't mean you can use, or learning doesn't mean you can actually practice and put them into put them into practice into a sentence and use them correctly. So I don't think it's really a French mistake, but it's really it's a French problem. Yes, definitely, because it's from the French schools. So I am agree was my number one, and it's definitely the one I hear all the time. Um, another one that I hear a lot is with the verb have. And I will actually say two mistakes with have. So that is going to be my mistake number two and number three at the same time. First thing is when people use have with the negative sentence. Um, most of the time I hear I haven't alone, like nothing after, I haven't a cat. It's a mistake. Um, because you think that haven't can go alone. But if you say I haven't and you want to talk about possession in English, you need to say I haven't got or I don't have. Because have is a normal verb like understand and you don't say I understand it, like putting the NT at the end of the verb doesn't exist in English. If you want to put a verb in negative, it's always I don't, I don't have, or I haven't got, which is a sort of like a married couple, they go together, it's to have got. But if you separate them, then that's my mistake number three, um, that's present perfect. I haven't played. 
and here there's a mix between the two. Um, so my mystic number three is the, the use of have. And people don't make the, the difference between present perfect and simple past, which is one of the most difficult difference to make when you're French, because present perfect just doesn't exist in French. And we desperately try to find the equivalent. Um, but one of the biggest problem is that people consider that the passé composé in French exists in English with have. But no, it doesn't. Uh, when you use the passé composé in English, it's simple past. So the simple past is very simple. You just take your verb and uh, put the simple past on it. For example, your verb is go. You don't say I have went. You say I went and have completely disappeared. It just doesn't exist in English. Um, except if you say I have gone, so you use the third column of the irregular verbs and then it's present perfect. It's not simple past at all. And it's not the same situation, not the same context. The passé composé is a finished event in the past and the equivalent in English is simple past. So just directly your verb in the past. Don't use have. Um, so that was my number two and number three. Number four is um, the difference uh, between regulars and irregulars plural. Uh, so plural, I'm not sure you understand, so I'm going to write it down. Can I comment? Yes, I do. Okay, so plural. That's the plural, so irregular plurals. I'll give you an example. Equipment. Never take a S in English. You don't say equipments. You say equipment. Even if you have more than one, if you have more than one, you need to use pieces of. Information is also the case. You never say informations, but you say information or pieces of information. Equipment, never S. Series, always S. So this one is also irregular. You don't have Siri with no S. It's always series. Uh, furniture, for example, in my room, I have a lot of furniture, but I don't say furnitures. It, there's no S. So um, it's a bit complicated for a French person to understand when you have plural or not. Uh, there's no easy way here, it's just know them. Uh, the list is not very big. So um, you have, for example, one person, two people. You don't say persons, but you say people. Um, child, children. Um, that's just irre irregular or regular plural that you need to remember. Plurals or no plural um, that you need to remember. Um, best way is actually the more you listen to English, the more you integrate them and you just use them. You can also find pretty easy list, well, very easily a list online of the plurals in English or irregular plurals. Uh, but I think information, equipment, and furniture are the only three where you don't put an S. Um, series, you put an S, but it's, it's pretty limited. So if you have to learn them, it's not that difficult. Um, and yeah, the most, the most, the, 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 the more you will remember them. And so that was my number four. And my number five is the use of tenses. Um, so what I call tenses is, <clears throat> I'm actually um, mentioning also what I said before in two and three when I talked about present perfect. So is the, the big mistake that French people do is trying desperately to find an equivalent of the French conjugaison. Um, but as in English, it's so much easier it's just impossible and it just makes much more confusion to try to find an equivalent which doesn't exist most of the time. 
So to make sure you understand the tenses, which in English there are only two, present and past, um, you just need to think about two things. What is the structure, which is always the same and super, super easy, and when to use them. And forget about the French equivalent. Um, our grammar is very complex. It is not in English. But we don't function the same way. So you have to think as an English person or native from, I said English, but not only from England, but native speakers, um, English native speakers, and see that they actually use a tense depending on what is the context and what is the situation. But not making the connection with French, which just doesn't work. And that's pretty much for my five most common mistakes. Um, as I told you at the beginning of the video, there are others. Um, but those are really the ones that I hear a lot with my students and that I'm constantly correcting. Um, so I hope that you understood what I meant and maybe you're making this mistake. So um, can you just put down below from the list the five mistakes that I mentioned? Are there any mistakes that you personally do and after this video you're able to correct it or maybe you understand why you make it. Um, just put it down below. Remember that if you're watching this video on replay, I still see your comments. I just don't answer in the video, but I still answer afterwards in the comment section. So which mistake do you make in French, which is part of my list? Or maybe it's not. If you want to add another mistake, still good information for other people um, who are thinking that maybe they're alone making those mistake, but they are not making those mistakes. Oh, that's nice. You're just coming to see me before the cinema. That's nice. Um, so try, try to think about, oh, so hi, Andre too. If you're watching this live, I'm happy if you can join, uh, try to comment below and tell me if you make one of those mistakes to, um, well in French, um, like I am agree, I haven't, um, trying to translate the French passé composé or irregular, regular plural, or the tenses trying to make the tenses the equivalent, trying to find the equivalent. Is there anything in this list that you do and that you understand now with this video? I hope I really helped you and you, you feel a little bit less frustrated and bad about this mistake because seriously they are so common um, and it's just a consequence of the French language actually so it's it's totally normal and I think it's important to to feel good about it and just know what is the mistake and try to correct them um, okay I'm trying to see your um, I make three oh you make three okay sorry it was just stuck together. So you make three on five, so three out of five, three mistakes on the five. That's a pretty good number. Um, and so that's good. Um, and I hope that this video help you to not make them anymore. Um, but sometimes it's just part of you. <laughs> and if I, even if I help you, even if I tell you a lot of things, this is something like, it's like staying. Um, but as long as you know about it, you can still correct yourself. Keep in mind that it's not because you make mistake that people will not understand you. Never think that English has to be perfect to be able to communicate. It's just a way for communication. So um, people don't care if you make mistake as long as they understand what you're saying. You're not going to be an English teacher like me. So if you're not going to be an English teacher, why would you care about having a perfect English? Because the goal is getting the message through. So whatever mistakes you make, that's okay. Um, as long as people understand you and people from countries like Spain and, and Italy would probably make sort of the same mistake because the origin of the language, their native language is pretty similar from ours. Right. That's it for today. Uh, we've done quite a big, uh, live about nearly 20, 20 minutes, I think. Um, have a nice, have a nice film. Enjoy it. Um, 
for Ellen. And for the others, I wish you an amazing evening. I will see you next week. Uh, next week, I'm actually... What am I doing next week for the live? I'm checking. Um, oh, 